Good evening and welcome to South Carolina ETV and ETV Radio's coverage of the 2015 State of the State Address. This evening marks Governor Nikki Rondawa Haley's fifth appearance before the Joint Assembly of the House and Senate Chambers. The governor is returning here after a resounding victory that returns her to the governor's mansion for four more years within the governor's office. She's expected to face a very different House and Senate chamber as each has new leadership as well as appointees to key legislative committees. We anticipate that the governor will talk about her broad-based education reforms package, one that provides incentives to attract teachers to poor and rural districts throughout South Carolina. We also anticipate that the governor will discuss ethics reforms, as well as our aging roads and infrastructure, and economic growth and development, jobs training, and jobs creation. This 2015 State of State Address offers the governor the opportunity to set this tone for her next four years of governance. Our Honorable Governor and her escort committee has arrived. The members of the Joint Assembly will please rise. Governor of South Carolina. How are you doing? Governor Haley is now entering the House Chamber and greeting individuals as she's walking down the aisle. The governor is in a blue dress, broad smiles, of course, having just won re election to the office and having the inaugurational inauguration event last week. The applause are quite consistent and loud. The governor is walking into a chamber that sees uh, significant changes. Uh, we have a new House Speaker, Representative Jay Lucas from the PD. And we also have a new Senate Pro Tempore in Hugh Levin. The governor is very energetic greeting both sides of the aisle. Lots of hugs, lots of shaking of hands. She's getting close to the podium. And she is now at the podium, acknowledging those closest to her. Oh, yes, there she is. More hugs, lots of smiles. and good energy inside the House chamber for now this, her fifth state of state address to the state of South Carolina. I anticipate that the governor will present a broad agenda this evening. As more hugs and acknowledgements as she is now behind the podium. Other individuals are taking their seats as the governor is prepared now to step to the podium and present her address. Please be seated. Please be seated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the Joint Assembly and honored guests, I'm proud to present to you the Honorable Nikki Haley, Governor of South Carolina. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the General Assembly, constitutional officers, and my fellow South Carolinians, tonight we have come together to discuss the state of South Carolina, the success we have enjoyed, and the challenges we face. But we must first acknowledge, as we do every year, that without the selfless sacrifice of our men and women in uniform, who have dedicated their lives to protecting our freedoms, this night would not be possible. So now please join me as we pay tribute to those who gave the last full measure of devotion in the service of their state and country. Captain James E. Chafin III, West Columbia. 
Staff Sergeant Gerard Jerry Gass, Jr., UG. Deputy Sheriff Joseph Joe Matiskovich, Somerville. Investigator Holmes N. Smith, Jr., Sumter. Patrolman First Class Robert Blazak, Somerville. Laurent Larry Britton, Charleston. Lieutenant John M. Burns, Myrtle Beach. Firefighter Paramedic Kellen A. Fleming, Chesney. On behalf of all South Carolinians, to their families, know we will never forget. Many of you enjoyed the festivities of last week. We want to thank you for making it a special time for our family and the state. We are thankful that Michael has been home from deployment for over a year now. He continues to be very involved with Youth Challenge, advocating for adoptive children, and managing the mansion grounds, all while keeping a smile on his face. Please help me welcome and thank the coolest first man ever, Michael Haley. And what would Haley Family Fun Night be without two really fun kids? Michael and I realized recently that four years from now, they will have spent half of their childhood in public life. In public life. Rena and Naylin continue to take it in stride and make us both very proud. They are 16 and 13 years old now. Rena is starting to tour college campuses, and Naylin continues to tour basketball courts. Please help me welcome two little ones that make me proud to be their mom, Rena and Naylin. One of my favorite parts of giving this speech each year is being able to recognize some of the people who have helped make South Carolina the special place that it is. When we started our administration four years ago, we thought it was very important to highlight people in our state that make us smile. We will always have changes in government, but for all those changes, we have selfless people who in the name of service and out of love for our great state, give South Carolina a good name. I know there's been a lot of chatter about who Charleston's next mayor will be. Before we get too far down that road, we should take a moment, stop, and appreciate what we have. Here tonight is a man who has built a legacy of service in the Low Country and across South Carolina. He has served as the mayor of Charleston for nearly 40 years, and he has helped transform that city into the most popular destination in America, a crown jewel of not just our state, but of our nation. He has decided to step down as mayor, but he will forever be remembered as one of South Carolina's great gentlemen and devoted public servants. I ask that you join me in welcoming Mayor Joe Riley and thanking him for his lifetime of service to South Carolina. Just a few short weeks ago, we lost a great South Carolinian with the passing of Governor James Edwards. As governor, as Secretary of Energy, and later as the president of MUSC, he spent a huge part of his life serving others and cemented a place in our state's history as a man we can all look up to. 
But as we all know, it is nearly impossible to be as strong and significant as he was without the support of a loving family. Tonight, I have the great privilege of introducing to you his incredible wife, Mrs. Ann Edwards. Mrs. Edwards asked that I thank you, the members of the General Assembly, as well as the people of South Carolina, for the tremendous support you gave Governor Edwards during his full life and that you've given her since his passing. Mrs. Edwards, thank you for your service and for sharing your wonderful husband with us. You and your family will forever be appreciated by the citizens of South Carolina. Nobody has represented us with more dignity than Lance Corporal Kyle Carpenter. We were able to have his parents join us for this speech in 2012 when he was recovering from his injuries, but we are thankful to have him here today, safe and healthy. Last year, Michael and I were so proud to attend the ceremony where Kyle was awarded the Medal of Honor for his acts of valor during his deployment in Afghanistan. I'd like to take a moment to read a passage from the official citation recognizing his heroic actions. Quote, Lance Corporal Carpenter and a fellow Marine were manning a rooftop security position on the perimeter of patrol base Dakota when the enemy initiated a daylight attack with hand grenades, one of which landed inside their sandbag position. Without hesitation and with complete disregard for his own safety, Lance Corporal Carpenter moved toward the grenade in an attempt to shield his fellow Marine from the deadly blast. When the grenade detonated, his body absorbed the brunt of the blast, severely wounding him, but saving the life of his fellow Marine. It is rare that you are able to be in the presence of a true American hero. But that is exactly what we have with us today in Kyle Carpenter. Please stand and join in showing our deepest gratitude for his service to our country and his bravery that has made us proud. South Carolina continues to be a major success story when it comes to recruiting jobs to our state. We make it very clear to the companies that choose to invest here that they are joining our South Carolina family. The businesses we're honoring tonight could have invested and moved anywhere in the country, and they chose to join Team South Carolina. We should never take that for granted. Tonight, representatives of a few of these success stories from all over the world are here with us. As I introduce them, please hold your applause until the end, and then join me in giving them a warm South Carolina welcome. Please stand when I call your name and remain standing. Representing 151 jobs in Fairfield County from Enor Corporation, Mr. Stephen Udwin. Representing 1,700 jobs in Chester County from GT Tire, Dr. Enki Tan. Representing 270 jobs in Lancaster County from Hale Gold Mine, Ms. Diane Garrett. Representing 175 jobs in Clarendon County from Kent International, Mr. Scott Kamler. Representing 615 jobs in Aiken County from Medac, Mr. Bijan Mimar. Representing 40 jobs in Chesterfield County from Nestle Waters North America, Mr. Lance Tully. 
representing 70 jobs in Greenwood County from Portacel, Mr. Dioga da Silvera, representing 500 jobs in Florence County from Reese Food Products, Ms. Kim Reese Beck, representing 300 jobs in Dorchester County from Scout Boats, Ms. Sherry Ferguson, representing 2,400 jobs in York County from the Lash Group, Ms. Tracy Foster, representing 65 jobs in Richland County from the Right Dose Corporation, Dr. Umesh Dalvi, representing 500 jobs in Spartanburg County from Torre Carbon Fibers America, Mr. Toshiyuki Kondo. Thank you for making South Carolina your home. Ladies and gentlemen, the state of our state is inspiring. Over the last four years, I have had the great privilege of traveling far and wide, representing our state and her people. What I've learned is we're not the only ones who love South Carolina. Whether I'm in California or Connecticut, Montreal or Minnesota, the story of South Carolina's success is front and center. Everywhere we go, there is excitement, and frankly, not a small amount of envy over who we are and what we've been able to accomplish. It's a beautiful thing. But last year, I got to experience just how far that word is spreading. In November, as many of you know, we traveled to India on a trade mission. India, of course, is the country of my parents' birth. I hadn't been there since I was two years old, so the trip was a special one for me there are few things more impactful than seeing firsthand, for the first time, your own history. But what was even more amazing to me was the connections I found between South Carolina and that far off land. I visited a workforce training center at Riot Barar University in Mahali. Hundreds of students turned out for a talk I gave and they had so many questions about South Carolina but they didn't just know about South Carolina because we have an Indian American governor. The Skill Development Center at their university is modeled after ICAR in Greenville. Their school has signed an agreement with Clemson University to expand cooperation and allow their students to share in our educational opportunities and vice versa. Everywhere I went in India, from students to business leaders to government officials, they knew what was going on in South Carolina. Our state is getting noticed across the country and the world, and we're getting noticed for our triumphs, not our controversies. I couldn't be more excited or more proud. Together, we have built an environment where businesses can and will and want to grow. It's an environment that has enabled Michelin, Bridgestone, Continental, and now GT to manufacture tires in our state with our workers. It has led international giants like GE and BMW and Torre to say, yes, we want to call South Carolina home. It has created a better life for our people, a brighter future for our children. We've worked hard to build a world-class, world-renowned business climate and we must fight to keep it. Any truly objective review of South Carolina's business landscape notes the benefit we get from the minimal role unions play in our state. In 2013, we had the third lowest percentage of union workers in America, with just 3.7% of South Carolina workers choosing to join a union. I cannot express to you the extent to which this is a game changer when we're trying to bring new businesses to our state. We have a reputation internationally for being a state that doesn't want unions because we don't need unions. And it's that reputation that matters. Now that reputation, and even more importantly, a South Carolina company are under attack. And they are under attack by an organization that has proven it cares nothing 
for South Carolina or our workers. Boeing's story, how they came here, their magnificent progress in Charleston since 2009, their commitment to their workers and to our communities is one that certainly need not be told here. We all know it. We're all proud of it. But in light of the fact that the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, one of the largest labor unions in the world, is gearing up to try and unionize the Charleston plant, their South Carolina story bears repeating. In stark contrast to Boeing, which has invested billions of dollars in the future of what may be their most important project in the people of South Carolina, the IAM has never, never believed in us. First, they flatly, publicly stated that South Carolina workers do not have the necessary skills to build airplanes. Our workers have proven them wrong. But no matter what the IAM says today or tomorrow, we should never forget what they really think about our state. And then they sued us. They tried to shut us down. So every time you hear a Seattle union boss carry on about how he has the best interest of the Boeing workers in Charleston at heart, remember this. If it was up to that same union boss, there would be no Boeing workers in Charleston. The truth is the IAM cares about one thing and one thing only, its own power. And the successes of Boeing in South Carolina, and more so, the successes of the non-union workers who populate its ranks are a threat to the IAM. Like bullies do, the union bosses will try and cover up those truths and crush those threats. But we've beaten back the IAM before, and with the support of those of us in this room and the good people all across South Carolina, I have every confidence that the Boeing workers in Charleston will see this play for exactly what it is and reject this union power grab. <laughs> While Boeing and the 787 Dreamliners is an example of what real workforce training success can look like, we don't have those same stories everywhere in South Carolina. I have challenged my entire cabinet to get creative about how we put people back to work. Whether actually placing employment offices in our prisons, as we did in Manning last year, so that offenders come out from behind the fence with a job, or moving families from welfare to work, we are about workforce programs that meet the real needs of real people. Think about the single mom struggling to make ends meet that can't afford to pay for the training she needs. Think about the young man who just graduated college in liberal arts and can't seem to find a job. Think about the father of four whose ability to move up in his company is capped out. They all need opportunities. They all deserve a better life. We're gonna help them. We're gonna help them get there through a new initiative called Succeed South Carolina. We have always offered training programs through Ready SC to train people who want to work in places like BMW, Boeing, and Continental. It's been tremendously successful, but we're going to expand it. We will now begin working with other companies, companies of different sizes and in different industries, companies already in South Carolina to create programs that will lead to a job. The best part, if that single mom wants to get started, we'll pay for her training. And when she gets the job we've trained her for, which she will, she'll pay us back and pay it forward. The new initiative will not only help those citizens who wanna be retrained, but also assist our smaller companies, those that represent 97% of our employers by helping them get the workers they need to keep moving and to keep growing. The economic gains we have made since the end of the Great Recession are no secret to anyone in this room. But it's not enough for us to simply celebrate them. We must keep driving on. The tens of thousands of new jobs announced in South Carolina don't mean anything if it's not our people who are filling them. The massive drop in our unemployment rate over the last five years is amazing. 
but we must recognize there are still thousands out of work. We can address these issues. We can make sure that as a state, we're serving the single mom, the 22-year-old graduate, and the capped out father, and that we're serving them well. We can make sure that any business, small, medium, or large, has a willing and well-trained stable of South Carolinians ready to fill all the jobs they can create. And we can make sure that South Carolina is a state not just of tremendous growth, but of real, true opportunity for each and every one of our citizens. The journey to that place of opportunity doesn't start with any of the three people just mentioned. No, like most things, it starts with their children. It starts with how we educate all of our children. Last year, I stood at this podium and asked a very simple question. Are we willing to look South Carolina's children in the eye and tell them that their future will be largely determined by the circumstances of their birth and not the endeavors of their life. And by your actions, you answered resoundingly, no. And I thank you for that. And more importantly, years from now, the children of South Carolina will thank you for it, for the changes we made are real. We invested in teachers, we invested in technology, we invested in reading, and for the first time in our history, we acknowledge that it costs more to teach those children mired in poverty than those born into a secure economic situation. We changed the face of South Carolina. But as we said last year, this was not a silver bullet. The investment we made must be ongoing. It must continue, and it must touch every school district. So in our budget, we've doubled down on our investment in technology. We've expanded our commitment to reading coaches. We have devoted more to professional development so our teachers are better equipped to teach in today's world. And we've proposed a new initiative that will help our rural schools get and keep the kind of highly qualified teachers their students deserve. First, if a student graduating high school is willing to spend eight years teaching in their underserved home district after college, we will pay for up to four years of tuition at a state school. Second, if a teacher who has graduated from college and is burdened by student loans commits to teach in a rural district, we will contribute to their student loan repayment. Third, if a teacher has less than five years experience and begins teaching in an eligible district, he or she will receive a pay bump, advancing his or her salary to the level of a teacher five years further down the road. Finally, if a teacher wants to attend graduate school at a state college or university, we will cover the cost of that education again in exchange for a commitment to teach in a rural or underserved district. And all of this will be done without spending a single new tax dollar. These options aren't just available to new teachers, they're available to all teachers. We want that shining star teaching in Lexington to decide it's time to take on a new challenge and teach in Denmark. Because nothing can ignite a child's desire to learn quite like a great teacher. We need those great teachers going to our rural schools, touching our most at-risk students, and we need them staying there. Now we've given them an added incentive to do just that. Last session, you joined our call for reform, recognizing that the education of our children transcended the normal, sometimes foolish, constraints of politics and partisanship. I ask that you do the same this year, that you continue to raise the ceiling of opportunity for every child in South Carolina. The spirit of cooperation, the commitment to moving our state forward that defined our shared efforts on education, sadly did not extend to the reform of our ethics laws that South Carolina so desperately needs. <clears throat> Many words have been spoken on this issue and much time wasted in these chambers with no result. 
I believe I have said all I need to. You all know exactly where I stand. Reform our ethics laws. Restore the public's faith in our government. Let's do it right and let's do it now. We have also seen challenges over the last four years, in many cases due to the long-term neglect of some of our agencies. And so we went after that neglect. We strengthened our mental health and drug abuse services. We focused not on dollars spent, but services given to our most vulnerable, like those with disabilities. And we strengthened agencies that had been heavily burdened by changing and increasing populations. In every case, we have focused on results for those in greatest need. One agency has been more challenging than most, the Department of Social Services. There is no question there were changes that needed to be made. And to understand just what those changes should look like, we went right to the source, our caseworkers. They told us how painful, how difficult it can be to protect children from their own parents. Their frustrations became my frustrations, and their passion for children fueled our efforts to improve DSS. We have since added caseworkers, changed processes, added second shifts, improved technology, forged partnerships with law enforcement, created new career paths for caseworkers, and so much more. We have changed DSS for the better. It is in a far different place than it was a year ago but there is still work to do. We have found the person to lead that charge. Susan Alford was recently quoted as saying, quote, it's always challenging, but we have to do it with openness, with integrity, with humility, and with a lot of determination. I couldn't have said it better. I have no doubt that for the Department of Social Services, its dedicated employees, and most importantly, the children they serve there are brighter days ahead. There is an important economic convergence going on in South Carolina today. On one side, we have a growing economy with more of our people working than ever before, with unemployment down to rates we haven't seen in many years, with people moving from welfare to work by the tens of thousands, and with new companies moving in or starting up all the time. It is indeed a great day in South Carolina. But how did we get there? There are several factors, including our business-friendly regulatory approach, our right-to-work laws, and our strong economic development and recruitment efforts. But there's also no question that our tax system plays an important part in our economy too. Our economic competitiveness as a state is in really good shape, but the nature of competition is that just when you think you're doing well, your competitors are gaining on you. In order to continue our state's remarkable progress, we must take further steps to improve our standing. We are competing for jobs internationally, nationally, and regionally. Where we stand compared to our neighboring states matters. Some southeastern and southwestern states, Tennessee, Florida, and Texas, have no income tax at all. Georgia's tax is a full percent lower than ours. And just last year, North Carolina cut theirs by two full points to below even that. In that competitive environment, our state's 7% income tax rate stands out and puts us at a disadvantage. In order to keep the ball rolling in our economy, we must bring down our income tax. <laughs> at the same time, it's widely recognized that we have major infrastructure needs in our state. We have a very real problem with the way our transportation dollars are spent. Our system screams out for reform and restructuring. The condition of our roads and bridges is a statewide concern, 
and yet our dollars are being spent with zero statewide perspective. The current system with commissioners representing congressional districts and selected by local delegations is the ultimate exercise in parochialism. Instead of fighting for the needs of South Carolina at large, they fight for the needs of their districts, which means they fight each other. I don't necessarily blame them. Until we make wholesale changes to the system, doing so is in their best interest. The problem is, it's not in South Carolina's best interest. So I will not support more revenue for our roads and bridges until we restructure the Department of Transportation. Simply shipping more money into the current bureaucracy would be like blasting water through a leaky hose. Some of it would reach the right destination, but too much of it would end up in a mess on the ground. I won't do it. That said, deficient roads and highways are an economic issue. That's why we supported a billion dollars in new road funds last year, which was the biggest infrastructure investment in a generation. It's why we proposed in our executive budget dedicating an additional $61 million in auto sales tax funds entirely to roads. But we know that's not enough. We still have very substantial infrastructure revenue needs that have to be addressed. We have studied every option. Some have advocated raising the state gas tax. Yes, we do have the third lowest gas tax in America. Gas prices are now down to their lowest level since 2009. Non-South Carolinians who visit our state would pay a portion of the tax, and we would boost the revenue stream that is dedicated to improving our roads and highways. But there are also major problems with it. We have not gotten to where we are as a state with our strengthening and growing economy by raising taxes. Quite the opposite. If all we do is increase taxes, whether it's the gas tax or some other tax, we will hurt our citizens, we will discourage job creators, and we will dampen our economy. As I've said many times, I will veto any straight up increase in the gas tax. That's just not gonna happen while I'm governor. It's the wrong thing for South Carolina. So here's the deal. Let's do three things at once that will be a win-win-win for South Carolina. Let's cut our state income tax from 7% to 5% over the next decade. That's a nearly 30% reduction in state income taxes. Nationally, it will take us from 38th in income tax competitiveness to 13th. Regionally, it will put our rate back below those of North Carolina and Georgia. It will be a massive draw for jobs and investment to our state, and it will put more money in the pockets of every South Carolinian, letting them keep more of what they earn. It will reward work, savings, and investment, all the things we need to do to make our state stronger and our people more prosperous. Next, let's change the way we spend our infrastructure dollars and get rid of the legislatively elected Transportation Commission so the condition of South Carolina's roads is no longer driven by short-sighted regionalism and political horse trading, and we stop wasting our tax money. Finally, let's increase the gas tax by 10 cents over the next three years, and let's dedicate that money entirely toward improving our roads. That will keep our gas tax below both Georgia and North Carolina, and we can do it without harming our economy. Because when coupled with the 30% income tax cut, it still represents one of the largest tax cuts in South Carolina history. Now, I hope everyone listened carefully to what I said. This is a three-part package deal. In order to get my signature on any gas tax increase, we need to restructure the DOT, and we need to cut our state income tax by 2%. If we do all of those things, we will have better roads and a stronger economic engine for our people. That is a win-win. I 
I'd like to personally say thank you to Speaker Jay Lucas for his leadership and his commitment to working with us on this and many other issues going forward. And I'd like to thank Chairman Brian White, Representative Gary Simrel, and the other dedicated members of the House Transportation Committee who have worked for months to find a solution to our crumbling road system. We can all agree that our state's Department of Transportation must be reformed in order to bring more jobs to South Carolina. And I look forward to working with both the House and the Senate to solve this very real problem this year. Between August of 2013 and this past November, I spent my days and nights traveling South Carolina and talking with her people. Campaigns are a lot of things, but above all, they're an opportunity. An opportunity to hear from our citizens who act as our state's conscience. An opportunity to look backwards at where we were and what we've accomplished. And an opportunity to share a vision for where we want to go. I have heard it said that the election results have given me a mandate. I've thought long and hard about what that might mean. Webster's Dictionary defines the word mandate as, quote, a command or authorization to act in a particular way on a public issue given by the electorate to its representatives. The way the word has been used since November suggests to me that many think I have been given the authorization to act, effectively given permission to push through the agenda I desire. That is not how I see it. I never saw the election as a referendum on me, but on all of us, on the direction we have taken South Carolina over the last four years. Likewise, I don't view the results as anything but a command, a command by the people of our state to continue along the path we have traveled together since I first took the oath of office as their governor. That path has been one of complete commitment to the economic future of our state where every action we take is one that makes it easier for our companies to do business, expand, and hire our people. It has been one where we jump at every opportunity to restructure our archaic government so as to better serve our citizens. It has been one where we opened our borders to new businesses and kept them shut to job-killing unions. It's been one where we fight every day to give South Carolinians the honest, open government they deserve. It's been one where bickering for bickering's sake between branches of government became a thing of the past. It has been one where we place the education of our children above our parochial and political self-interest. And it has been one where we put South Carolina back on the map for all the right reasons. That's the path I believe in. It's the path the people of South Carolina overwhelmingly embraced 10 weeks ago. And it's the path I will continue to follow. For if we do, there is no telling the heights to which we can take the state we all love. Thank you, God bless you, and may he continue to bless the great state of South Carolina. serious issues facing the state of South Carolina, one of them being a union challenge, another one being the roads issue and the challenge of how to fund the much needed road repairs and infrastructure throughout the state of South Carolina. She offered a three-pronged plan to address that issue. One that she said that all three prongs must be in the legislation so that she would approve it and sign it. Otherwise, it would receive a governor's veto. Main standing is the governor and her distinguished party depart the Joint Assembly. Coming up now, we have the Democratic response to Governor Haley's speech with Senator Joel Lurie of Richland County. Good evening, I'm Joel Lurie. I serve in the state Senate and I'm from right here in Columbia. I'm honored to give the response to the governor's state of the state. From an early age, I learned from my mother and my late father, Senator Isidore Lurie, that politics can be a positive way to bring people together from different backgrounds and viewpoints 
to find solutions to improve our community and state. I grew up in the shadows of great governors, governors like Bob McNair, Dick Riley, and Carol Campbell, and I watched in awe how these leaders could sit down with members from both parties and move our state forward. We have the opportunity and the responsibility to do the same. To Governor Haley, we're anxious to roll up our sleeves and work with you. We all want a better, healthier, and more educated South Carolina. We may have different ideas of how to get there, but the time has come to find common ground and accomplish more for our people. First of all, let's talk about roads. I've heard from people all over the state, from key business leaders to everyday folks driving to see friends and family. Bottom line, our roads and bridges are deplorable, embarrassing, and unsafe. This is an issue that affects every South Carolinian. We're talking about public safety, quality of life, and future economic development. In short, we need an excess of $1 billion a year to make a difference and address a problem that has gone neglected for decades. We shouldn't have to wait for a bridge to collapse and suffer the loss of human life. The people of our state elect us to make tough decisions. These decisions must focus on two key areas, priority funding and a fair distribution of revenue. My friends, the money's not going to fall from the sky. If we want better roads, we're going to have to pay for them. Anyone that tells you we can do this without new revenue is not serious about addressing the problem. All options should be on the table. Let's do this right. Let's do it this year. Now I'd like to discuss health care. The key to a productive and successful workforce is a healthy workforce. It's illogical and senseless that our state refuses to expand Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act. Twenty-seven other states have accepted Medicaid expansion, states led by Democrats and Republicans, and millions of Americans now have access to preventive and regular health care, many for the first time ever, but not here in South Carolina. We are letting our tax dollars flow into the expansion states. We would prefer to turn our backs on 200,000 working South Carolinians, and as opposed to them going to a physician when they get sick, we send them to the emergency room, where the cost is 10 to 20 times more. And by the way, somebody's paying that bill, and it's the rest of us who are fortunate enough to have insurance. This is not rocket science, it's common sense. Let's take a moment and talk about jobs. South Carolina is certainly seeing great benefit from a national recovery. And Governor, we appreciate your continued focus on bringing industry to South Carolina. But we should also make sure that working families can pay rent, utilities, and put food, food on the table. Perhaps now is the time for South Carolina to join 21 other states, again, states led by Republican and Democratic governors, to raise the minimum wage. It is truly impossible to make ends meet at $7.25 an hour. Maybe we can come together and help small businesses with a tax cut, and at the same time require that the minimum wage be increased to help working families across our state. In the area of education, let's work together and let's find a plan that addresses the needs of the schools in our underfunded districts. Every child deserves a chance for a sound, quality public education. Every day and dollar we spend trying to avoid the inevitable, trying to avoid our responsibility, is a day and a dollar wasted. The Supreme Court has spoken. We have a legal and a moral responsibility to address this crisis. It's just about as simple as right and wrong, and it's wrong to delay action on this issue. Also, we've made great strides in four-year-old kindergarten. Let's make sure every four-year-old in South Carolina has the right start, as these first few years of a child's life and education are statistically proven predictors for the future. And last, but certainly not least in education, is the support for our teachers. Our teachers hold the key to the future of our children, and many of them work 60 plus hours a week preparing our students for the challenges that lie ahead. Let's make sure they're paid at a level that allows them to stay in the profession they love and take care of their own families as well. Switching gears, if you're like me, you're tired of seeing our state lead the nation in the tragic area of domestic violence. Legislation has been filed in the Senate with bipartisan leadership, including myself, that will take guns out of the hands of domestic violence offenders. Talk about a no-brainer. We can do more to prevent this horrific crime. We must pledge to get this bill to the governor this year. Anything short of that is unacceptable. On ethics, I believe we can get a bill passed where all sides can agree on 75% of the points. The time has come to pass a tough ethics bill and make real progress in ethics and transparency. 
No further stall is necessary. Let's pass what we can agree on and get it done early this session. And finally, I want to mention the Department of Social Services. I've worked alongside my two friends and colleagues, Senators Katrina Sheely and Tom Young, for the better part of the last 14 months. What we've seen and uncovered is atrocious. Rapid turnover of caseworkers, workloads way beyond reason, and failed leadership at the top. I'm pleased that the governor has included more funding for caseworkers in her budget, and I hope the General Assembly and the governor will come together to fund, reform, and improve the Department of Social Services so that the horror stories we heard this year will never, ever happen again because of government dysfunction and inefficiency. To the people of South Carolina, we have great challenges and opportunities ahead of this year. As leaders, the time has come to put down the partisan shields that have prevented progress. Our focus should not be on what it takes to keep a job as an elected official, but what it takes to do it. Just, week, just this week, we celebrated another birthday of a great and inspirational man, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King once said, quote, a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. My friends, the answers are not overly complicated, and they should not be about what is best for either Democrats or Republicans, but what is best for South Carolina. My hope and my prayer is that this will be the year that common sense prevails. Thank you, and good evening. And we're here with Representative Bruce Bannister. You are the House Majority Leader. What were your impressions of Governor Haley's fifth State of State of Address? Well, I thought this was one of the most exciting ones she had given because she really got to lay out all the accomplishments from her first term. The economic development strides the state has made was, were really great. And talking about Boeing and some of the successes and some of the South Carolinians who have really sacrificed a lot to make South Carolina the state that it is, it was fun to hear her talking. I thought it was really good, really good State of the State. She laid out a three-pronged approach to our roads challenge here in South Carolina. What are your thoughts on that plan? Yeah, I, I like her idea of having a comprehensive plan, fix the DOT, fund it, and make us more competitive in the economic uh, recruiting business fields. So I thought it was really good. I thought it was something that the House could get behind, the House Republican Caucus. Obviously, we've been working over the summer coming up with a comprehensive plan and now having her leadership saying this is how we'll this is what I'll support. This is what we can do to put money into our infrastructure, uh, which is a core function of government, something we've got to do, we've got to do it well. I, I thought she, she took a big step tonight. I thought that was a great, a great um, move for her. Well, thank you for your time this evening. Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Joining us now is Representative Phyllis Henderson. Nice to thank see you for being us with, with right. us this All evening. Right. What were your thoughts of Governor Haley's uh, fifth you state know, of state? I have been involved in this transportation committee for the last three or four months, and I was just glad to see that she came out with something. And honestly, I'm 100% behind the fact that we need to be cutting our income tax. Um, I represent a portion of Greenwood County, Michelin, North America, other businesses that, honestly, for us to be competitive in the southeast between Florida and Georgia and North Carolina, we have to be cutting our income tax. So I think it's fantastic that we're that she's talking about that and we're looking at that as an option for us to actually address the growth in our economy and the roads at the same time. So no pun intended, but do you think her three-pronged plan will gain traction in both chambers? Well, you know, these are the kinds of things that we've been talking about for a while. That is restructuring the commission. What's the best way to deal with, you know, the problems or perceived problems that we have in the commission. But funding is also an issue too. And part of it is how can we boost the growth in our economy to address the needs? And I think that the income tax is a really, really big one. I think it's a very good starting point for us to begin this conversation with our committee as we put together our plan over the next couple of weeks, um, I think the things that she has proposed are definitely some really good options for us to begin to coalesce around. Well, thank you very much for yeah. spending time. Thank you so much. Thank All you. Right. Senator Harvey Pillar, good to see you again. Nice seeing you. Always a pleasure. Nice to see you. Back for another year here. Yes, sir. Um, so what are your initial impressions on the governor's fifth state of state? Well, uh, tonight, I I think you heard a prime example of why Governor Haley was re-elected by a landslide. It was her best speech yet, I think. It touched on all the pinch points. Everybody was anxiously awaiting her transportation plan, her DOT plan. I uh, appreciate her rolling that plan out, that three-point plan. It's a great starting uh, point. I look forward to working with her. Hopefully we'll get something very similar to what she uh, recommended. I appreciate it. Uh, 
or income tax reduction. I think that will help economic development. Of course, increasing funding for the VOT, and I've advocated reform for years, so I, I can support on all three um, points of the plan. Uh, Nick, another big part of her platform or approach to this, the legislative session, of course, is education reform. Absolutely. Read to succeed. Where are oh, we with that? Oh, well, you know, I love that. But it continued, she said she continued to uh, support that and increase uh, reading coaches. I uh, will keep the pedal to the metal on it. It's a great, great, great issue for, for education and for our economy. There's no question about it. And, and that's her strong suit. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's selling our state. And she is the greatest salesman I think we've ever had. Senator Piller, thank you very much for thank your time you. this evening. Thank okay, you. have a good night. Representative Chip Limehouse, good, good evening, to have Don. You How are you, sir? I'm doing fine this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, your impressions of the governor's fifth I, of state. I was of state. overall very pleased with the speech. In South Carolina, we make the greatest airplanes in the world at Boeing. We make the greatest cars in the world at BMW. But we have the worst road system in the country, and our roads are a disgrace. And the governor has put forward a plan, and. Um, I'm going to support that plan, and I believe the political will here is, is to get something done. Uh, our roads are in deplorable condition, and now's the time to act. It seems like part of that plan, of course, is long-range funding as well as short-term funding. Do you think you'll be able to strike the balance of addressing the more immediate needs as, as we lay out the 20-year sort of plan? Well, the immediate needs are very immediate. We have a $30 billion shortfall right now, and so you know the infrastructure bank has been struggling to take care of these needs, but the, the 10 cents a gallon is a minimum, I think, uh, coupled with the tax decrease. Now, that's what I really like about the plan is, you know, during the Sanford years, we had similar plans pop up and they ne did not get much traction. But I think the political will is here because this is a, a net tax decrease if you look at the numbers that the governor's proposed. That's what I really like about it. It's not a tax increase, it's a net tax decrease coupled with the income tax reduction. And that income tax reduction from seven to five is going to bring jobs to South Carolina. I'd even like to go lower, but we're going to be struggling to get to that number. It's a lot of money, and uh, but we're going to do it. And of course, reform of large agencies and departments have always had challenges. So how do you think- Well, we've reformed the DOT twice, so we may as well make it three <laughs> times since I've been here. So no, um, but, but it, we'll try another reform. and We'll do anything we can to build roads in South Carolina. And, and lastly, I want to touch on the jobs training. We've got to have that to underpin what we're doing here with, with Boeing and BMW and all the things that I've mentioned. Um, and higher ed too, the, t the type of jobs we want to bring here require higher education and, and that's something that needs to be talked about too. Strong workforce development. Absolutely, Don. Well, thank you very okay. much for having me. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. Senator Allison, nice How to have you? you. I'm doing very well to see me. Wonderful uh, to be Very happy you. to have you here. What were thank your thoughts you. initially of the, of the governor's uh, speech this evening? Well, I'm very excited. Just having been named as the new House Education Chairman in Public Works, those are two areas that we're very invested in, the infrastructure of the state and the education of our children of the state. Um, I thought that the governor had a good plan. I've been serving on the House Transportation Committee, and we've been looking at a lot of the reforming of DOT as well as how we're going to fund the infrastructure infrastructure that we need to better in this state and move forward. And I think she has a good plan there. And I look forward to working with her and moving on that. And as far as the education goes, I think that we have a great opportunity this year with the new state superintendent of education and a governor who's very invested in education and workforce investment to be able to move forward on both of those things. There are some unique challenges with underserved communities in our rural nature of our state. They Do you are. think the plan will address those very well? Well, I think working with the governor and the new uh, state superintendent will be able to come up with the needs. We want to delve into where the real problems are. I mean, this has been 21 years coming and it is time for us to invest, delve very deeply into the, the needs of those areas and also to look at our funding mechanism for the state and to make sure that all of our children, no matter what their zip code is, that they're getting the quality education that we know. There's some wonderful things going on in South Carolina that we don't always hear a lot about, this is true. but we want to make sure that we lift all in this state when it comes to education. And we want to continue to make sure that we've got a education educated and skilled workforce that will be able to fill those jobs that are coming into our state. So I think together, and, and there's just a good fresh air it seems in the General Assembly this year with the governor, new superintendent, uh, the new businesses that are coming in and the great opportunity that we have. It a is, change, yes. and it's change for the good. Awesome. Well, thank you very thank much, you, Senator. John. Appreciate your time. Have a good night.
Representative Forrester, hey, nice to have you? you here this evening. Thank you for having us. What were your initial impressions of the governor's fifth now state of state address? Well, I'm excited about what she's done since she took office. You know, 59,000 jobs to our state, $14.8 billion in investment. It's just been tremendous. She's a superstar when it comes to economic development. Now she's focusing on workforce development, and I think that's a key, and we're focusing on that in the House. That's going to be one of our key initiatives along with roads, and I was pleased to see her road plan and uh, I'm excited about it because it looks to be revenue neutral. Well, you hit on something when I wanted to ask you about workforce development. What do you see the legislature doing this session as relates to workforce development? Well, we've got some teams put together. We'll be working with business and industry to see what their needs are and see what we can do from a legislative standpoint to help recruit younger folks into manufacturing jobs in our state. Great paying jobs are, are out there and available, so that's, go that's going to be what we're about this year. Well, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, come up next. We have Representative Eddie Tallon. Eddie Tallon. Yes. I'm sorry I don't know everybody, but That's nice to right. meet you this evening. Nice to meet so you. So what were your thoughts of the governor's fifth state of state address? Well, I think she did a great job, and, and, and she recognized, most importantly, the most important thing about South Carolina are the people that make South Carolina so great. And the other thing that she's done, and, and I just think she's been a great jobs governor, she's opened up the office, something that we need have needed in South Carolina for a long time is for the governor to open her door or open their door and, and let the businesses know that we want them in South Carolina. She's done an excellent job at that. She's formed a relationship and a partnership with our businesses that will pay dividends for South Carolina for many years. Do you see anything of her legislative agenda that will face significant challenges in the House and Senate or do you think it's going to be a fairly easy paved path? Well, I don't know how easy anything is in the House and Senate. You know, it may be more easy in the House to, to get some things done, um, but, you know, we hope that it's going to be a great year and that we will accomplish many things in, in the legislative session. Well, thank you very much for your time this evening. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Lucas. Good to see you, sir. Don Goes, pleasure to meet you, it's sir. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, what did you think of uh, Governor Haley's fifth address this evening? Oh, I thought she set a very optimistic tone for the state of South Carolina. I thought it was a speech that suggested cooperation between all the bodies of government. Uh, she touted her business um, acumen over the last four years, and I think she's done an outstanding job. I was happy to see her talk about workforce development. We've done a lot in that area, but we still have a lot to do. Um, Governor Haley continues to focus on education, which is something we need to continue to work with in South Carolina. Um, she's sincere about working with the House and Senate, and we look forward to working with Governor Haley. As new Speaker of the House, uh, what are the challenging things you're encountering so far at the beginning of the session? Well, you know, it's all a challenge as a new Speaker. Um, we uh, we want to get an ethics reform package passed in January. Governor Haley alluded to that. We've been focused on that for the last three months. Um, obviously, we want to take a look at our infrastructure. That's a project we've been looking at since September. So we want to you know, look at Governor Haley's plan, look at our plan, see if we can reconcile the two together. There are a lot of challenges facing our state, but there's a lot of opportunity also. You're from the PD region, one of the, one of the rural areas of the state. Uh, do you see a lot of help to the rural areas of South Carolina? Well, uh, the rural areas of South Carolina do need help. At the same time, I obviously see the Office of Speaker is more of a statewide office. Um, we look to help all areas of the state, but we have an opportunity to also cast an eye toward rural South Carolina and what we can do there. Representative Lucas, thank you very much for your time. What a great you. honor. Thank all you, right, sir. Thank you very much. Senator Scott, you. thank you Pleasure. for being here this evening. Good thank you for your time. You. What were your first thoughts, your initial thoughts, on well, Governor Haley's uh, State of State address tonight? There were a couple of issues I thought she would have at least talked about, the equity lawsuit. Um, this General Assembly, before we leave, we've got to begin to do something about that. We, she talked briefly about uh, a plan down the road to fix our roads in South Carolina. We can't wait three years until we get a restructuring bill done, not with all the other issues that we have before us. I was kind of a little taken back. We only talked about jobs for teachers. What about those that we need to be able to tool industry with, with tech people? We she didn't mention anything about minimum wage in this state. A lot about labor unions and the right to work state, but some of these major companies come in and we'll have unions in there. Uh, how we'll get around that, that, we'll have to wait to kind of see how that works out. Being on the other side of the aisle, do you see opportunities for the Democratic Party in this session? Well, there's always opportunity. We always, that, that group will end up fixing all the problems anyway. The ideas are out there. We'll be more than happy to work on the other side of the aisle to try to get these problems fixed. Senator, thank, thank you, you, you very so much, much for your time. Good to be with you. Okay, thank you.
Senator oh, Gregory, thank you very much yeah, for being here this evening. Here. Uh, your initial thoughts on Governor Haley's now fifth state of state address. Well, I was most interested in what would be her road funding plan. And uh, I'm pleased with uh, what she proposed. I thought that uh, the possibility of a fuel tax increase would not uh, be there, but uh, she found a way to include it as part of her three-pronged proposal. She set a high bar for us, but certainly DOT needs to be uh, needs a different management structure. What we've created is probably the worst of all possible worlds, and uh, it needs to be a cabinet agency. It needs to be accountable to the governor, who's accountable to all the people of the state. So uh, I think that uh, you know she searched, showed some courage in proposing uh, to increase the fuel tax, but at the same time uh, reducing the income tax to where it's uh, more competitive with other states. So it's a well thought out framework and now we just have to fill it in. And what are your thoughts on her education reform package, especially that part of attracting teachers to rural right. and uh, underserved right. districts? Well, that's a tough nut and um, you know it does going to take incentive to get good teachers uh, to the rural districts and uh, I think she's put a good bit of thought into how to do that um, and uh, it's going to be you know front burner issue for us this year in the legislature so I think she has laid out a path for us on uh, three or four very important issues and there'll be you know, a lot of twists and turns in that path between now and signy die but hopefully we're successful in accomplishing the agenda that she's laid out. Well thank you very thank much you. for your time sure. this evening. All right. Representative Rutherford, How are you? thank you for your time. Good to see you. Doing fine. Good thank to you. See you. Thank you. You're the, uh, of course, the minority speaker of the House. The minority leader. The, the minority House. leader yes, of the House. Sir. Yes. yes sir. And uh, when, within that role, first and foremost, what are your thoughts on the governor's speech this evening? I'm disappointed. It was almost laughable to watch her take credit for reforming an agency which was DSS, where children were dying and nothing was being done. She refused to replace her director, uh, and, a, and a Democrat and a Republican, Katrina Sheila and Joe Lurie, had to get together and make sure they forced the issue to get the governor to do anything. And she then took credit for reforming, which was amazing to me. I then watched as she talked about a roads plan. We have been watching. Democrats held a press conference yesterday, and we said that we would support any plan the governor came up with. What we watched today was actually no plan. We called it hashtag no plan Nikki. It's disappointing for her to talk about raising the gas tax 10 cent. And let me tell your viewers, every penny in the gas tax increases about $33 million to their tolls to the roads of South Carolina. Unfortunately, if you're going to offset that with a decrease in income tax, what you're talking about with a 10 cent increase is $333 million in new money offset by a $417 million loss. And those are rough numbers, but that's about it. And so what you're going to look at over the next 10 years is actually a net loss to South Carolina and no new money to fix our roads. Our roads problem is a $42 billion problem. Even if you don't offset it with, an in, with a decrease in income taxes, you're only talking about $333 million new dollars. You can't fix a single road in South Carolina when that's all you have to do it with. As minority leader, do you see a path to compromise and seeing the Democratic point of view expressed within legislation moving forward? We, like I said, are willing to support any plan that she comes up with, but it's got to include something that's going to fix the problem. She's not doing that. You could see in that chamber tonight Republicans sitting on their hands and not applauding when she announced her plan because even they know all she's doing is handcuffing both the House and the Senate and telling us that even we can't come up with a plan that's going to fix our roads or she'll veto it. Representative Rutherford, thank you very much thank for you. your time. Have a good evening. You too. Hello. Representative Collins, thank yes, you very sir. much for your time this evening. Yes, sir. First off, if you would uh, summarize what your thoughts are on the governor's speech this evening. Yes, sir. Well, I was, I was uh, pleased. Uh, you know, her laser focus on jobs and the economy, I think it served our state well. Uh, the second issue, as far as roads, is our number one issue in Easley, where I'm from, uh, number one issue in the upstate, and number one issue uh, across the state. Uh, so I was uh, pleased with finally the unveiling of the plan. and. Um, in politics, I try to find the common ground, and I think there's uh, some things that we can find common ground and work on. Do you anticipate that the governor will get her plan completely as she presented tonight, or will it be something that's going to see compromise along the way? Well, I think in everything there's going to be compromise, but uh, hopefully we can work on her plan. Um, it's something that she's in favor of, so we know that we have her support. Um, but I'll, I'll be looking at my colleagues, and uh, hopefully we can uh, move the ball forward. And that's what I try to do in every issue. And roads, again, it's the number one issue, so we need to uh, address this issue. And, and if the governor is behind her plan, uh, then I think our, our caucus, our, the House, we can get behind it and, and hopefully move the ball forward. Well, thank you very much for yes, time sir. this evening. Have a good sir, night. Nice thank you very much. Representative John King, thank you very much for your well, time this evening. Thank you. Thank you so very much. First off, let's start with your initial impressions of the governor's uh, state of state address. Well, I was honestly disappointed in the governor's um, address tonight. First of all, she made no mention of the Abbottville um, decision that was given by the Supreme Court. 
and the equity funding um, for our schools here in South Carolina. Also, if you look at, she never spoke about health care in this state and how rural hospitals are closing down and how people have to drive, drive hours and hours away just to get to hospitals or to receive health care in this state. She bashed unions. And I think that we need to be a state of open minds so that people can make those decisions and be open to the idea of having unions come into this state. So I was really disappointed in um, what the governor spoke about tonight and was disheartened um, about that she made no mention of the um, education. And she, when she talked about education, she did not mention the Abbeville decision. And if she really means um, and, and doing what's right for education in the state of South Carolina, then she would not be appealing to the Supreme Court the decision that they made. And she would just stop this lawsuit. Representative, thank you very much. Thank you so very for your time much. Scene. Okay, thank have a good you. night. Representative Hennigan, thank yes, you very much for being with you. us this evening. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank Good. you. So what were your thoughts of the governor's speech this evening? You know, I thought she covered some wonderful points, but there were several things that I wanted to hear her address, especially in equity with the Abbeville lawsuit. Uh, it really bothered me that after 19 years that this lawsuit has been on the books, that, that she would like to address it again. That was a major issue for me. Also, uh, Marlborough County is where I'm from. I was hoping that she would mention something about the minimum pay wage that people are paid. $7.05 will not take care of, of many of the families that we have because they, we are in a rural area, we are in a poor area. We, I was hoping that she would mention something about an uh, uh, increase in the minimum wages. And the other one was the uh, infrastructure. It, I was really concerned because one billion dollars is not going to take care of our roads. That only takes care of one billion dollars. That's 41 billion dollars that we need to still be looking for. So those are some of the concerns that I had. But I was very happy to be a part of this tonight, you know, and to hear her. I think that she's uh, working very diligently, and I will still support it because she's still my governor. Well, thank you very much thank for your you time very. this evening. Okay, thank Have you. Have a good night. Okay. Representative Tinkler? Don Ghost, nice, nice to meet you. Thank you yes. for your time this evening. Thank you. So what are your thoughts on the governor's speech this evening? You know, I, I think that um, there are a lot of good points in her speech, but there still remains to be uh, seen really what a plan is for infrastructure. I think that um, the plan that she stated really is only a shell of, of what we could expect um, and that there is far too large of a deficit um, to, to be, you know, I guess, brought together with just her plan of, of probably what one would be one billion dollars, I assume. So. Now you replaced an iconic figure in the state house. I, I did. Um, are there any challenges that you associate with that having replaced uh, Representative Harrell? You know, there there are certainly challenges, but I have found that everyone up here is extremely welcoming. Um, it has been a fantastic honor um, to be here, and I look forward to serving District 114. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Have a good night. Thank you. Representative McKnight, Good thank evening. you very much for being here. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, thank you. Great. What were your initial impressions on Governor Haley's fifth state of the state? Uh, I was a little disappointed by the governor's uh, state of the state address. I didn't think she went over quite enough, and there's several issues that she didn't touch on that I think are paramount to the success of South Carolina. Particularly, I was saddened by the fact that she did not at all mention the Abbeville decision. Um, I'm from a rural district, and our schools are totally suffering, and we need to address that problem now or South Carolina cannot prosper. The other thing that I was disheartened by is the fact that she didn't mention the $123 million that we've paid in fines because DSS has not complied with the federal law. Um, we've been paying that money since 1998. $123 million could have gone a long ways to address the issues such as education. So with her not touching on that tells me it's not a priority to her. The other thing that bothered me or troubled me is that there was not one mention of health care in this state. Um, we are losing our rural hospitals. Uh, we've lost one in Bamberg. We're in danger of losing the one in Kingstree. And we need that because it, it goes to the health of our citizens. And, and I'm disheartened by the fact she didn't mention that. Um, most important, and also, when I heard her talk about DSS, she didn't at once mention the children that we lost due to the ineptitude and neglect of the, of the higher ups at DSS. And lastly, her infrastructure proposal doesn't generate enough money. We need way more money than her tax cuts and proposals allow for. So she needs to really pay attention to more issues and, and tackle the real problems and not gloss over them. 
Thank you very much for your time this evening. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Representative Mack. Hi, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank great, you. How great. are you this evening? Doing fine. What were your impressions of the Governor Haley's state of state address? I was disappointed there was no mention of health care to begin with. The uh, Medicaid expansion decision, turning away that money, we didn't save money, it went to another state. Uh, uh, $11 billion, 44,000 jobs, 300,000 people without insurance, estimated 1,300 will die. It's major in the state of South Carolina. That was a major blow. So health care wasn't mentioned. I didn't like the way unions were trashed also. And, and I know that in the state of South Carolina, that takes some working through with a lot of people. But I would say to folks out there, forget about political party, forget about race, forget, forget about ideology. If you work a job, if you work a job, unions got you a 40-hour work week. Unions got you weekend. Unions got you vacation. And it, it makes sense if you work a job, regardless if you're black, white, Asian, Latino, or whatever, you need a union. So those two things, the union bashing, not mentioning um, health care. The other thing I think was very important is roads. We need $42 billion. Us, we, we all know that in these chambers. And the best case scenario that her plan would come up with would be one billion as opposed to 42 billion. Then you're gonna look to cut taxes. It's almost like the magic bullet theory with the Kennedy assassination. How, how is all this going to work? You're gonna cut taxes here, cut taxes there, yet produce a billion dollars where truth be told, we need 42 billion. And last point, if we get to a point in the state of South Carolina when someone is driving one of these, old, over, one of these overpass and they fall down and there's a relative under tons of concrete, I pray that that does not happen and then we take roads seriously. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank Have a good you. night. Representative Erickson, thank you very much for joining us this Absolutely. evening. Absolutely, thank you for having us. What were your first thoughts on the uh, governor's speech this evening? Well, I was really proud of her in, uh, in addressing um, the successes that we've had as a state. Um, our people are very special, and the companies that come here, we, we like to applaud them. Um, I especially like the education initiatives that she's going to put in place. I believe we really need to make our teachers feel appreciated. Um, I'm an educator by trade, um, not in the classroom any longer, but I do know that they, um, they need to sacrifice a lot for our students. Um, and I like her initiative bringing them where they're needed. Um, I also applaud her three-pronged approach on our road reform. Infrastructure has got to be one of the largest issues before our citizens, certainly one of the things I hear the most in Beaufort. And I have said over and over again that I wouldn't be for a tax increase unless we did reform. And I'm very happy to hear that she's kind of attached to the same uh, philosophy. And um, lowering the income tax will do exactly what she said. That will make us much more attractive to people coming to the state, and that's what we're really about. I was a little upset, though. Um, I chair the House Ad Hoc, Ad Hoc Committee on Domestic Violence. I was ready to ask you a question about that. Were you going to ask yes. me? I'm sorry I jumped ahead. That's quite all right. You know, we're second in the nation in women who are killed due to domestic violence. And the Senate has had a committee working on it. The House has a committee working on it. The Senate's bill um, that deals with just the penalties piece passed out of judiciary today. Um, our bill, I expect to pass out of our committee, um, our ad hoc committee to be considered um, and read across the decks next week. And it's comprehensive. It has social pieces and bonding pieces. That was my pieces. question. Do you see significant legislation exiting the state house this year? I as do. It relates to criminal I do. Domestic it's violence? Coming from both houses, we have a strong, strong understanding of what our citizens sees the problem and what our judiciary would like to see to help them with tools in the toolbox and law enforcement. And those three pieces are very key. Those citizens who are, are struggling with this issue are not just a few. Um, and this is a ripple effect issue. And I was really sad that she didn't take a moment. I know she had a lot to address, but um, it's something that both of our bodies feels important to get done early. And I was hoping that we would get a good nod. I know that um, I can't say enough about Attorney General um, Al Wilson, who has championed this issue with us. And I, I'll, I'll bet he's a little bit sad, too, that it didn't make the cut. And I know she has time constraints, okay. but um, I have to It's an important issue. It is. It affects so many areas. Um, if people are having those sort of things happen in their home, then they're, they don't make good employees a lot of times because they're having trouble making it to work. Um, the children suffer from those situations. 
then they bring the stress to school and then they can't focus on what's happening in their academic lives and we pay for it over and over and over again sadly um, and the big problem with domestic violence is our repeat offenders and that's what we really have to nip in the bud so we're going to restructure it instead of being like um, our, our uh, DUI loss where it's by occurrence we're going to be asking for it to be treated by severity will be more like the assault and battery law, which we feel is a lot more appropriate. The Attorney General agrees, and I believe the Senate bill has the same sort of structure. But we're also doing a few things like asking that domestic violence be included in our education um, of our children in middle school when they're doing health education. So they've got tools in their toolbox to know how to handle those stresses. So well, thank, thank you, you very so much, much for your time. And have a, have a productive session. Thank you. All right. Representative Anderson, yes, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Thank you, sir, for Your having me. Your initial impressions on the governor's speech this evening. Well, um, as the newly South Carolina Legislative Black Caucus chairman, uh, we've talked about some issues across the state of South Carolina. Uh, number one, when you look at what was said tonight, uh, we look at, first of all, uh, the gas tax, uh, something that we need desperately for our roads and bridges. And all across the state of South Carolina, we have terrible roads, we have bridges that are crumbling, and we really need to do something, and we need to do something with this now. The thing that I look at is we need to have a living wages increase. Uh, you think about it now, you know, folks who are speaking uh, makes $100,000 or better, you know, from downstairs. But you think of the average person that makes less than $15,000. How would they feel making less than $15,000? We need to have an increase in living wages for all of South Carolina, and we need to do it this session. And I feel like if we increase the living wages, everything else will fall in place because that means people will have more money, they will spend more money, the economy will boost. Uh, across the state also, we're looking at the education system. We need to deal with the education system. Every year for the past 10 years since I've been here, we have fought for the education system getting uh, teachers uh, increase, pay raise for state employees. We need to do that. The more we do that, these are hardworking people that makes low income. And we need to really boost their income so that they can put more into society also. So health care, hey, nobody said anything about health care. We need to deal with the health care issue in South Carolina. I see local hospitals throughout the state of South Carolina in rural communities being closed and that's not good when a person have to travel 30 to 45 miles to get you know their health care taken care of that is no good for the state of South Carolina we need to have our local rural hospitals open they need to stay open so we need to fix the health care in South Carolina also well thank you very much for your time this evening you have a good night Representative Taylor, John, good to see nice you. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here and thanks for doing this coverage. It's important. Appreciate it. It's, it's a pleasure. Um, what were your thoughts on Governor Haley's uh, speech this evening? Well, as she was leaving the chamber, I told her I thought her remarks were bold and straightforward. And uh, I, I really, particularly on the education issues, I serve on the House Education Committee. Um, the rural issue with teachers and the need for teachers, it's a crisis. I've written about it. I've talked about it. She's addressing it, and I think uh, we, need to, we need to look hard at that because we need to retain. We're losing teachers all over this state. The first couple of years, they'll leave, they'll leave teaching. You know, the idealism falls away, and the pragmatic approach to teaching uh, can, be, can be pretty dreadful. So that's, a, that's a, an issue. The, on the roads issue and the taxes. Uh, I've been the primary sponsor of the fair tax for several sessions here and, and this is a step in the right direction because lowering the income tax from the 7% rate to the 5% rate is truly more fair and it will generate new business here. It will. It, think about it. If you're a retiree and you look at South Carolina and you say they have a 7% tax rate on my income. Now, I've had people tell me that's when they didn't come here. Well, that's wrong. We need to entice them, and we need to be lower than our neighboring states. And I think the, uh, the, she's a, a got a good conversation going with the 10 cent uh, fuel tax increase over a period of time. And certainly the DOT needs restructuring. So I agree wholeheartedly with her approach to this. And the devil's in the detail, and we've got a lot of legislative work to do. But uh, she put us on the right path today. The House has been working on that, and uh, I'm, I'm encouraged that she encourages us to move 
move forward. So, do you think you'll she'll be, she'll be able to see a three-prong bill on her desk that she uh, will be happy to sign? Well, I don't know if it's a three-prong bill, but it'll be a three number of bills. bills. Uh, <laughs> yes, and I and I support every one of those issues. Uh, I was on a tax reform committee here a couple of years ago. One of our first issues was to lower the income tax. Again, I'd prefer the fair tax, eliminate the corporate income tax, the personal income tax, but this is a step in the right direction. Representative Taylor, thank you very thank much you for coming. You. you have a good night. Thank you. Representative you? McCoy, good I'm doing fine. McCoy, thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. What were your thoughts on the governor's speech this evening? I tell you, I thought the governor did a fantastic job in her speech, and I want to especially praise what she's done in terms of recruiting business to Charleston or business to South Carolina. Um, and, and what I think is also very, very important, we need to continue to put an emphasis on this, is our Port of Charleston. Our Port of Charleston is directly linked to our economy in South Carolina, directly linked to our jobs in South Carolina. When you look at a statistic where one in six jobs in our entire state is linked to our port in Charleston, I think it's important to continue to put an emphasis on that port, make it competitive on the eastern seaboard, and make sure we get it to that length that all container ships can come in and out, and we can export and import all, all types of goods for the state. And, of course, transportation infrastructure is a large underpinning of the port's effectiveness to move those containers up and down the highways. Absolutely. You can't have a, a, a proper functioning port if you don't have the infrastructure to back it up. So I think it's important that we put a lot of emphasis on fixing our roads um, and go right back to putting right back the emphasis back on our ports as well. Representative, thank, thank you, you very I much. Appreciate it. Appreciate have the time. Thank, thank you. you. Senator Davis, see you. how are things in the low country? Everything's fine, sir. How about yourself? I'm doing fine, thank you. Uh, what are your initial thoughts on the governor's speech this evening? I think she did a great job. I mean, I've been a, a down in that office and chief of staff before and helped the governor write a state of the state. And a lot has to do with the delivery. A lot has to do with the eye contact, the way she delivers things. She did a great job. Very optimistic, very upbeat. But the most impressive thing about what Governor Haley did tonight was lay out what I think is a solution to some of our really serious competitiveness problems in South Carolina. The 7% income tax rate is a very anti-competitive provision. 7%. It kicks in at $14,000 and above. Entrepreneurs aren't going to locate to South Carolina if we have that kind of an income tax rate. So her proposal to cut from 7 to 5% will be a huge competitive advantage for South Carolina. And I like the way she coupled that with reforming the State Department of Transportation, the way we allocate our state highway dollars, and also raising the gas tax. I think that package, those three things together, reforming the DOT and the way we spend existing dollars, increasing the gas tax by 10 cents over 10 years, and reducing the income tax from 7 to 5%, is really a win-win-win, as the governor said, and will make us more competitive as a state. I was very encouraged to hear her take leadership on this thing, and I hope she takes it out there to the people and that the people demand these reforms because real change comes from the outside when people demand it. It doesn't come from up here. It comes from when people demand it. So I hope Governor Haley takes this message out there, and if she does, I think it will resonate. Of course, you come from an area that also has many rural areas and underserved communities as well. What, what are your thoughts on the education package? She's always taken a great leadership role in that regard. I think that dates back to the time when she was a kid. I mean, she was raised in rural South Carolina, in Bamberg, South Carolina. So she knows the, the challenges that rural communities have. And I think the way she spelled out the incentives, getting the best teachers into those areas, getting, getting good teachers in the classroom, she showed leadership on that last year and she showed it again tonight. So ethics, education, and infrastructure reform, I think she hit a home run on all three, and I look forward to working with her. Senator Davis, thank you very much. You have Take a good care. night. Yes, thank sir. you very much. Representative McLeod, well, good to nice see you. To see you. Nice I to saw you just came in to see her speech. So, what were, you your, so much. what were your thoughts as, uh, as you heard her speech? What are your impressions? Well, thank you so much. I deeply appreciate the governor's interest in, uh, in the public schools, particularly the interest in rural schools, and I, I strongly support her interest in the beefed up, tightened uh, uh, ethics law. Uh, but I have a different point of view on roads and the highway user fee. I ran for re-election and had some luck. And one of the promises I made is we would improve rural roads in Newberry County and throughout South Carolina by increasing the highway user fee, i.e. the gas tax. And we cannot continue to allow our roadways to deteriorate. The notion of having a three-part arrangement where uh, reduce income tax and kind of destroy the Department of Transportation and, and then have a, a, an increase in gas tax is just not suitable for this day and time. We've got a severe crisis and we really don't need any state house baloney. We need some action today to improve and maintain the public roadways we have. And so I would strongly support a standalone gas tax increase at this time. Representative McLeod, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. You have it's a good a pleasure night. being with you. Thank you very much. Representative Bamberg, hey. pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you.
What were your first impressions of the governor's fifth state of state? Um, to be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed. Um, I expected a bit more in terms of uh, fixing the roads issue that we have in the state. Um, if, that's, if that's our plan, uh, I don't think that's much of a plan. Um, it doesn't take, I mean, it's essentially a drop in the bucket in terms of the, the finances that we need to fully address the roads issue. Um, I also don't think it takes into account uh, where are the other revenue cuts going to gonna come from. A um, little bit disappointed I didn't hear anything about the Abbeville decision. Um, you know, in particular, the decisions that were made to try and obtain a rehearing for that. Um, also a little disappointed I didn't hear anything about the uh, health care situation going on in the state. Um, I'm from Bamberg, Bamberg County, um, as is she, and of course we don't have a hospital anymore. Uh, rural health care is really struggling in the state right now. Um, and although, you know, maybe the Affordable Care Act uh, discussion is maybe taking a back seat to some of the other priorities, it's still very, very important. Um, it needs to be in the forefront. Do you see a potential for Cross the Aisle to influence legislation to address some of the issues you're raising? Yeah, I am more than happy to work with anybody. Um, my thing is we've done so much talking, it's time to start doing some doing. Um, I'd like to see some action, both from Republicans and Democrats alike, and let's get these problems addressed. Because um, at the end of the day, it's about the citizens of South Carolina. Thank you very much for your time. You have a good night. All right. How you doing, Representative Gilbert, I'm doing yeah, very fine this evening. Good to see yes, you. Sir. Thank you for your patience in line there. It was yeah, a long well, one. Well, it was worth waiting. <laughs> My arm's getting tired. <laughs> Hold this microphone. Yes. So what were your initial thoughts on the uh, governor's speech this evening? Well, it, it had no substance. I mean, it sounded good, and, and like she always does, she makes things sound good, but it has no substance. I think it's, uh, it's about time we stop the union bashing. I, I think people have to understand uh, unions is a part of American history. It's our, uh, part of our liberty that we protect so dearly in America to give the right for a person to choose and whether he or she wants to belong to a union or not. That's their right. And I think a good leader should all, always understand that. You know? And uh, you know, we developed this banner here. That, as you can see, this thing says, enough is enough. And, and I live behind this. You know, we, we have to understand one thing. When you, as a governor, you take the podium, you're supposed to be about building bridges and, and, and not trying to cause a road of divide. You know what I mean? And coming off the, this, this would be the 86th 86, 86th birthday, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I want to remind everybody out there, the backbone of the SCLC movement was the unions. You know, and unions are part of the history of South Carolina and this country. But on, let's talk about other issues that are important, and I wish he had focus on this rather than redirect or refocus people on things that really are irrelevant. She should have been talking about gun violence. She should have been talking about domestic violence here in the state of South Carolina, health care, Medicaid, the quality of life for all Carolinians. I think people need to understand when we talk about the real issue, then and only then we're going to get things done. But the union bashing, I would have to join my people back home and just say enough is enough is enough. Well, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you, sir. You have a pleasant night. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Hey. Representative Alexander, yeah. pleasure to see you. Good You're see our, you. our last guest this uh, evening. Oh, man, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> but not least, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I want to uh, put my little piece back in. Anyway, I want to ask you for your first impressions of the governor's. Well, there are two things that resonate in my mind mm -hmm. about what the governor spoke about. Number one is that pre education, I think that's something that President Barack Obama is talking about in terms of individuals who are getting out of high school, having free education at the technical schools. In essence, that's what she was saying in terms of giving folks free training uh, for go job training. There is a direct correlation between economic development and education. Um, when industry is coming to our state, the first thing that they look for is how's your educational system or your learning system in this in, in, in this regard so I think that's a good thing number two that she never addressed the educational opportunities that that exists that does not exist for so many of our people here in South Carolina in lieu of, of what the Supreme Court of South Carolina has said in terms of we are not ad adequately educating those who are in this state I think she needed to address that it's a it's a us. And, and very, I mean, she did not say anything about it. Disappointed about that whole piece there. Um, she never said anything about it. She said a little bit about our roads and, and, and construction, but she said more so about the organizational structure of DOT versus this is what we are going to do in order to enhance the, the, um, 
our roads and our infrastructure here in South Carolina. If we are going to grow this state as she wishes it to be, and I hope that she would do, is that we need to look at our infrastructure, our educational system, our roads, our bridges, the whole gambit here in South Carolina. And those things really wasn't addressed as I thought they should have been, particularly in lieu of she's being given a mandate um, to lead our people here in South Carolina. Is it possible that the roads challenge has become so big that perhaps it's too big to overcome? Well, you have to start somewhere. You know, they, they are before us, and we have to start somewhere. I mean, not doing anything is not going to help. So we have to start somewhere. It is a large challenge. It's a huge challenge here for South Carolina, but we must do it. Um, the people demand it. The people are asking for it. Industries are asking for it. Economic development developers are asking for it. So we must start somewhere. It is a huge challenge, but to do nothing is to do nothing, and that's not going to help any at all. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You, this evening. you have a very good Thank night. You. Thank you, you very too. much. Thank you. Well, it's been a very interesting evening as Governor Haley delivered her fifth State of State address here in 2015. We want to thank you for joining us here on South Carolina ETV and our listeners at ETV Radio for the 2015 State of the State address by Governor Nikki Haley. Thank you and good night. We now join our program in progress.